Hello everyone, we are back with another round of Duty Mock Interview Series. My name is Jose and today I will be interviewing Peter for the role of an experienced Java developer. And before you write in the comments, the question that you might see today might be different if you come to a Turing Java interview because these questions were selected for YouTube purpose, okay? And without further ado, uh, let's, let's hear from you, Peter. Could you please introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about your background experience? All right. Hi, Jose. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is NNJ Peter. I'm a senior software developer here in Turing. And, um, I've been building with Java. When my journey with Java started in 2015, um, I learned the language so that I would be able to work on a project. And then, you know, it was fun and exciting because Java gave me the opportunity to work with um, some, some low-level hardware um, features and uh, it was fun. So I built some projects with Java, you know, learned some other languages. Uh, but, you know, 2019, there about, I switched to Android platform with my Java knowledge and Java experience, and I continue building projects in Java. Then, of course, added Kotlin as you know the default language for my 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 mobile development since Kotlin is built upon Java. So, I've uh, been waiting for close to a year now, and uh, it has been awesome and amazing. Nice. All right. Thank you for sharing. Uh, okay, could you please tell me a little bit more about some Java project that you have been working on? Oh, yes. Uh, my first project, uh, what made me feel much in love with Java was uh, I was building a fingerprint, a fingerprint or biometric authentication solution. And, um, I was going to use Java to, you know, um, communicate with some, you know, C++ DLA codes, you know, some assembly kind of, uh, processing on the fingerprint, so I was able to use Java to build um, the 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 authentication, the registering, capturing of biometric, and authenticating different users to for an access control app. And um, so, yeah, that's one of the most exciting future I've worked with in Java. Nice. All right, and let's talk about Java. Is there anything like a static class in Java? Oh, uh, for Java, no, you don't. You don't have what um, what is traditionally a static class, right? But um, there are a few ways to make a class act like a static class in Java. You know, and first off, you have to you know make make the class a a, a final class. Now, once you declare class as final, you are preventing it from being extended, right? Because it doesn't it won't make any sense to extend the static class in that sense. So the final class will help in that. Then I think the next thing um, you should do is to make the constructor private because um, once you make the constructor private, right, you are preventing anybody from initializing that class or creating object from that class. So uh, making the constructor private and another thing I, I, um, I would advise to do in that case is make all the fields and all the other, um, methods or functions in the class private. Um, um, static, you know, once you make them static, um, they can be assessed, you know, and, um, you know, they can be assessed and they can be, you know, edited then, um, because the, you know, the compiler is preventing you from declaring, mm -hmm. you know, in a non-static member, right? So, yeah. So I think with those methods, you can, you know, get, get a kind of a static class in Java. Got you. And so. What are the use cases for a static class? Oh yeah, um, I think the most popular one um, is the maths class. You know, maths dot pi to get the the value of pi, uh, math dot round. You know, these are classes where um, they have predefined predefined functions, predefined method. You don't want the user to have you know any 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 way of the inner workings of the class, right? Um, so maybe you can also use it in some database initializations where you just want to pick, you know, it's static. You are not creating an object from it. You're not, you're not assessing or editing any of the um, the variables in it. So um, those are two use cases. Yeah, where you have predefined predefined functions, predefined calculations happening in the class. And so those are two use cases I would call. Got you. All right, and move on. 
Uh, how can I synchronize it to process in Java? Okay. Um, you, well, it's not possible to do that in Java, right? Um, different Java applications, we have to use different Java virtual machines, you know, fully separating them, you know, to, to different boxes. However, you can use two, well, I can use a couple of options, but now I'll mention this. Um, you can use sockets or channel, you know, because each application is list is it will open a listening socket and um it will be waiting for some signal. You know, the other application will connect there and send signal. And you know, if it has completed something, you know, I, I mean I would I would advise that, but then there's um there's a Win API for Windows now, Windows development, Win APIs on Java, you can also use that to um achieve a kind of synchronization between two Java processes. All right. So if I got that right, you are saying that uh, there's no possibility to synchronize two process, I mean, natively. You have to use a kind of um, message, right? You have to send a message between two projects, two process. Yeah. Is that? Mm -hmm, yes. Yeah, that, that works for me. All right. And what is static initializer and they and and they are related uh to static class or are they totally different okay uh now okay a static initializer right uh static you know it's a static block of code inside java class mm -hmm. can only once you know before the constructor of main method so you want some some operations to happen in the class before you call the main method you put it static uh, um static initializer there um say for instance maybe you want to make a long database database operation call and you want to call that or the network call you want to call that inside the static initializer before you know you even construct the class or before you um call the main method and then um of course now with that definition is quite different from it um, what you call a static class because <clears throat> You can have a static initializer in a non-static class, in that sense. Got you. All right, move on. What's the difference between fail fast and fail safe? Okay. Um, fail fast and fail safe. Now, um, fail safe, um, like the property, it works with the clone of an underlining collection. So it's not affected by any modification in the collection. So, um, you know, uh, it's 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 you know working on the just the clone, right? And then any modification in the collection, it's not really going to affect when you use um, a fail safe. But then <clears throat> for fail um, fail fast, yeah, uh, it throws a concurrent modification exception. So. Um, you know why you try to modify modify while you're working on it so fail fast is going to throw a hey, you can't modify this here and then um all collections in java beauty packages are fail fast so you are always going to throw an exception but for the face face uh fail safe iterator you you won't get such exception because it's working with a clone my next question is regarding java heap okay what is the structure of java heap Okay, um, the Java virtual machine, you know, it has a it has a heap, you know, it's a runtime data area. Yeah, from there, uh, you, you have memories of all classes instances, um, every array, that's where it is allocated, you know. Um, once the JVN starts up, it creates an heap, right? So the heap memory is for objects that is reclaimed by an automatic, automatic memory management system. That's the garbage collector. Now, um, a heap will con contain live and dead objects, you know. So the live objects can be accessible by the application and they won't be subjects. They won't be the subject of garbage collection. Why the dead objects are those that will never be accessible by the application, but have not been collected by the garbage collector yet. So they are there, but um, they can never be accessed by the application, you know. So um, these dead objects can occupy the heap memory space until they are eventually collected by the garbage collector, you know. So um, it's, 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 you know, a runtime area for storing memory gotcha. for Java class instance and arrays. 
All right, next question. What's the, the trade-off between using an unordered array and using an ordered array? Okay. Uh, first, you know, I would say the time complexity in assessing an, um, in assessing and adding um, data to the array because you have an unordered array. If you're searching for any element in the array, you have to you have to touch every element at least once, you know. So, um, so I would say the time complexity of assessing any data there in an unordered array, right, is O of n. So it has to touch every element in the array because you don't you don't know the order. While in an ordered array, is O of log n because um, it decreases as you keep adding more elements. Then, um, then for insertion, right. For an ordered array, the, the time complexity for inserting an, an element inside the ordered array is O of 1 because you have to, um, I mean, if you are O of n, sorry, the time complexity of inserting is O of n because it has to move. If you are inserting any value into the array, it has to move every value that is greater than it's, you know, a step forward. So it's going to touch everything once. Okay. While on ordered array, the time complexity is O of 1. So it just adds to the end. Okay, uh, let's see if I get that. Okay, if you have a um, non-ordered array and then you need to insert it, you will push in the end, right? And then this is uh, O1 operation, correct? And then if you have a sorted array, for example, and then you have array from zero to 10, uh, and then you want to add in the number five, you need to locate where five is, right? And then shift to the right the all the next elements and insert five, the, the second five uh, before, before that, right? That's what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. And my next question is, uh, could you please explain uh, marshalling and demarshalling? Okay. Uh, marshalling is, uh, it's, it's, you know, it happens when when an application wants to pass its memory object across the network to another host, or maybe persist that's in storage, you know, that in-memory representation must be converted to a suitable format. So that conversion of, you know, that uh, memory object to a suitable format for either across a network or to another host or persist it in a storage, that's commercialing. And, you know, to uh, convert from that suitable format back to the in-memory object is called the marshalling. So marshalling is converting from your in-memory object to something else, you know, it's marshalling. That marshalling is converting back to the um, in-memory object. In my next question is not for you, Peter, it's for our audience, our Java developers that are watching this video right now. And my question is, what exactly is a marker interface in Java? Please let me know in the comment section, okay, what exactly is a market interface in Java. And I'll give you a pro tip. If you have triple years of experience and are confident with your tech stack, you can head on turing.com slash jobs, search for Java jobs and apply for that. If you don't have an account there, please create your account, uh, pass in the vetting process, do, the, do your test. And then once you clear the vetting process, you will get a job or at least an interview with a client. Okay, uh, another thing for you is if you are enjoying this content, please give me a big fat and thumbs up for this video right now and subscribe to our channel if you are not subscribed already. It's a red button down below and then you just need to press and it is free. Okay, all right, Peter, and coming back to you, my next question is what's the difference between serial and the throughput garbage collectors? So, yeah, the basic difference between the two of them is that serial garbage collector is most adequate for small applications, you know, where you have heap sizes of approximately 100 megabytes. But throughput garbage collector um, is more appropriate for applications that are very uh, large data sets or medium data sets, um, according to that. Got All right. And when should we use link list? over an array list in Java? Okay, um, you use a link list where you want, um, I would say sh you should use a link list where you have more insertion because insertion into a link list has constant time and you know, uh, in the time complexity. And then, but then once you are trying to 
access an item in the list, you have to go through all the lists. But uh, so you use a link list when you have um, when you want faster, you know, faster insertion or removal. But you use an array list when you want faster access, faster search in the array. You want to get an um, a random access is faster in an array list. Okay. Got you. And why use a uh, array of char is preferred uh, for password over a string? Yeah, majorly because strings are immutable, and um, you know, um, mostly you have to you have to rely on the garbage collector for you to get um, rid of um, the data. There's no way, aside from reflection, that you can get rid of the data of string before garbage collector kicks in. While with an array, you can explicitly write the data after you're done with, you can overwrite the array with anything you like, and you know, the password won't be present anymore um, in the system, even way before garbage collection. Got you. All right, and could you please provide some examples when uh, a finally block won't be executed in Java? Okay, um, I will name some couple of them. If your system exists, that if you call system dot exits um, before the finally block is called, maybe somewhere you're trying to catch. Uh, if your JVM crashes first, your finally block won't be executed. Um, if you call an infinite loop, you know uh, you won't you won't you won't ever get to the fi uh, to the finally block if you call an infinite loop in the try and catch. Uh, if your OS for will terminate um, the JVM process, um, the finally block won't be called. If you know there's a power outage in your system, maybe the whole system runs down, or there was an hardware failure, the finally block won't be called. And then um, if you know if it's if it's supposed to be executed by a demon trade and all other non-demon trade as it's before finally is called, you know, um, uh, it's not going to be called then. Got you. And my next question is the last one, I promise you. Uh, why is a string length uh, accurate? Okay. Um, it isn't accurate because um, it will ac um, account for the number of characters within the string. You know, uh, it will fail to account for code points outside what we call, you know, the basic multilingual plane. You know, there's um, code points where you, um, with the value of U plus, 10,000 or greater, you know, uh, because, you know, when Java was first defined, one of his goals was to treat all text as Unicode. But at that time, Unicode did not define code points outside of the basic multilingual plane. So by the time um, um, that's, by the time Unicode defined such points, it was too late for a chart to be changed, right? You know, so the correct way to really count the real numbers of the character within the string is, you know, some string code points count zero comma some string dot length, you know. So Got that's you. it. Got you. All right. Thank you, Peter. That was uh, really nice to speak to you today. Okay. Thank you. All right. And to everybody else, thank you for tuning this mock interview series. Uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. And we will be back very soon with many episodes uh, covering different text text and language. And if you are looking for some uh, specific mock interview series or mock interview, you can please uh, drop a message in the comment section below. Uh, and then we're going to record it for that. Okay. And don't forget to, gi to give us a big fat and thumbs up for this video if you enjoy this content subscribe to our channel if you are not subscribed already it's a red button down below it's free you just need to press it okay all right and take care and i hope to see you all again next video see you